Welcome to the gathering house uh, as we prepare for our Sunday worship. It is, uh, we are blessed today to have uh, Luke Benson with us. He's on the drums, a uh, world famous drum player. And uh, thank you uh, for joining us uh, as we uh, get into the word with our pastor and get into uh, worship uh, with our worship team here. And we pray that it is uh, pleasing to the Lord and that uh, He would allow me to pray. Precious Heavenly Father, we come to you today grounded in gratitude, Lord, every day. It's an amazing day you have planned for us, Lord, and we thank you for that plan, Lord. And, uh, Lord, we ask that you uh, keep that path swept clean, the path that you have for us. Uh, keep it free of debris so we're not tripping up, Lord, and uh, that allows us to know that it is the path that you've chosen for us, Lord, and we thank you for that. We thank you for all, um, all our church family as we are a little bit separated there uh, through this COVID time. We thank you for everyone that's challenged and everyone that's stressed out. Lord, uh, bring the peace, the peace that Jesus had going to the cross. Bring that to everyone here, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' mighty powerful name, amen. amen.
House friends, it's Miss Jen here. I miss seeing your smiling faces on Sunday morning, but I'm happy that I can at least come to you this way and have a chance to teach you some important things about our faith. Today I want to talk to you about the grocery store. Yep, I know that sounds kind of silly, but the grocery store is going to help us today to learn how we can be more Christ-like. So I want to ask you, do you like going to the grocery store with mom and dad? And when you're at the grocery store, are there some things that you like to buy more than other things? When I go to the grocery store, I look at the labels that are on the products and they help me to make choices about the foods that I'm buying. They inform me what kind of product it is, the quality of it and what kind of nutritional value it has. So labels can be super, super important. I have a couple examples here. Here we have some canned tomatoes. And you see it says herbs and spices. So I like to buy these canned tomatoes because the label tells me that they have something extra added into them. And I know that that is going to give my food that I use these canned tomatoes in, it's going to give it more flavor. And this one here is some cereal. And you see here it says high protein. Protein is super, super important for us. It's very healthy. It helps us to grow strong bones and good muscles. And I also find that whenever I have cereal that's higher in protein, I feel fuller longer. Protein helps to fill us up. It helps all of those other things we're eating with it to last longer. And so I'm less likely to snack on maybe some unhealthy choices in the morning. So labels inform us. They help us to make choices, in this case, about the food that we're eating and whether or not it's the type of food that we want to buy, we want to put into our grocery cart and buy. So this got me to thinking about what if people had labels? What kind of labels would we put on people? Well, you might know people in your life who if you had to label them, you would say that they are kind generous or maybe they're funny or helpful and those are good labels that would attract other people to them. These labels 
the high protein and the herbs and spices attract me to those food. And if people were labeled in those kind ways, that would attract me to those people. But what if somebody I knew had a label that said that they were unkind or selfish, that they were mean? I don't think I would be as attracted to those people. I don't think I would want to play with them as often because I would not be attracted to those characteristics. So we can see how our labels can be very important. The choices that we make will impact what kind of label people give us. And it says in the Bible, in Proverbs 22, verse 1, a good name is more desirable than great riches. It's more important to have a good reputation, to have that label that tells what kind of character we are, that that's a good character, than to have lots and lots of money. In our world, when we make those choices that label us as being kind, and, and when we make choices that so we have a positive attitude and are loving towards other, it helps the world to be a better place and it helps everybody to have a better quality of life. As Christians, it's also important because we want to reflect the goodness of God into the lives of the people around us. So when we choose to be loving and kind and helpful and forgiving, we're reflecting that goodness from God that we have through the Holy Spirit. So it's a challenge for us to make sure that the choices we're making and the attitudes that we're having are positive and reflect Christ. So I have a challenge for you this week or even right now when you're finished watching this video. I'd like you as a family to talk about the labels that you would give your sibling, your brother, your sister, your mom or your dad. What is something unique and special about them, how you can label them in a good way? Share that with each other to help build each other up and encourage each other. Let's pray. Father God, we are thankful that Jesus came and he gave us an example to follow. He showed us how you would have us act to show your love and your kindness. To, he exemplified forgiveness and, and, and teaching good things to us, Lord. And we thank you for that example that we find in the Bible. And we pray, God, that we would be able to, through the power of the Holy Spirit, take those things and apply them to our lives and that our, your, the kindness that we have would shine through, and that you would give us all those fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, and patience, and so on, God that we could reflect Christ into the lives of the people around us. Help us to have those good labels. In Jesus' name I pray. I hope you have a good week, friends. Bye for now. Well, good morning. Uh, we have some good news for you. We have an announcement we want to make to you. And on August the 23rd, we are going to have that long-awaited reunion time. And we're going to have an outdoor service at Roland and Teresa Fourier's farm. And it will be on that Sunday at one o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, you will have the choice of sitting in your vehicle and listening or bringing chairs or blankets if you want to sit in an area like that. So we'll be able to come together as the church. And so more details will be coming shortly, but we wanted to get the word out. So it's only a couple of weeks away as you hear this announcement. You'll need to reserve a spot and let people know that you're coming and uh, so that we can keep track of who's there as well. So August 23rd, Sunday afternoon, 1 o'clock at Roland and Teresa Fourier's farm. And we're looking forward to seeing everyone uh, as possible on that day. So keep that in mind. Well, as we prepare to look at the Word of God this morning, it's my privilege to read the passage of scripture and the scripture this morning is talking about Jesus healing the centurion's servant and it's a unique kind of miracle that says a lot to us about our walk of faith and the transformation that that brings so in Luke chapter 7 the first 10 verses tells us that story after he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion had a servant who was sick and at the point of death, who was highly valued by him. When the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews, asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, 
he is worthy to have you do this for him. For he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. And Jesus went with them. And when he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends, saying to him, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you, but say the word, and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes, and to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, and turning to the crowd that followed him, said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And when those who had been sent returned to the house, they found the servant well. Good morning, Gathering House family. We welcome you this morning and trust that uh, God is blessing you throughout this week of pandemics. And uh, we just want to make sure that uh, everything is going well. And uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, today we're going to be talking about transformation. Uh, we're going to be talking about the best known story of transformation in literature. And uh, it affects all of us, so uh, stay tuned and be transformed. Let's uh, begin with a word of prayer and then we'll uh, dive right into the Word of God. Father, we just thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you that your gospel changes people. Lord, that as we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we become transformed. We become a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And so, Father, I pray that uh, as we listen to this word this morning, as we hear the word of God enter into our hearts, we pray that each one of us would know that transformation story. Lord, the reality of it in our own life with faith in Jesus Christ. So, Father, bless our time together as we look at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as I said, one of the most familiar scenarios in the literature of transformation is the fairy tale of a prince or a princess being turned into a frog. And having been turned into a frog, if the prince or princess can just receive a kiss, he or she can return to his or her royal appearance. And we're talking extreme makeovers here in both directions. I heard about two old men who were out for their daily walk along the shoreline of a lake when a frog happened across their path. And one of the old timers slowly bent down and scooped the frog up in his hand. And he looked at the frog, fascinated by its ugliness, and suddenly the frog croaked. Hey, mister, I'm not really a frog. If you kiss me, I'll turn into a beautiful princess and will do anything for you that your heart desires. Startled, the old man put the frog in his pocket and plodded on down the shoreline. And for the longest time, the two old men trudged along in silence. Finally, the friend couldn't stand it any longer. And he said, well, he blurted out, are you going to kiss the frog or what? And the first codger replied, no, nah, I guess not. Well, what's the matter, his friend said, don't you believe what the frog said? And the old man said, yeah, I just think at my age, I'll have more fun with a talking frog. I suppose having a princess to deal with could have its downsides as well. But. but another familiar scenario in the literature of transformation is the biblical model of faith. And throughout the Bible, we learn and we see and we experience that faith transforms. Faith brings healing. Faith brings strength. Faith is the foundation of a life that's whole and abundant and good. Faith is the basis of a spiritual makeover. Over and over again, Jesus tells people 
Your faith has made you well. Faith is simple. It's a heartfelt trust in the power of God. And when faith is present, transformation can happen. New beginnings can take place. With faith, the door is open to extreme makeovers. The story of the healing of the centurion's slave that was read in our passage of scripture almost passes by our reading without our noticing it. At first glance, it seems such an average, run-of-the-mill healing for Jesus. But a closer look reveals a couple of interesting dynamics that speak powerfully to us today about this transforming faith. Jesus had just finished teaching a large crowd of people in Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount. And as Jesus re-entered Capernaum, a village in Galilee, many scholars considered to be his adult home, he was met by a group of Jewish leaders. And they asked him to go see about a slave of a Roman centurion who lived there. Centurions were like company commanders of the Roman occupation forces in Palestine, so-called because they had command of a hundred soldiers. Normally, the Jews hated anything having to do with Rome. But this man was good to the local people and had even built a synagogue for them. And one of the centurion's most valued servants was very ill. And the Jewish leaders appealed to Jesus for help. On the way to the centurion's house, they met some of the centurion's friends who relayed the centurion's message to Jesus, Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you. But only speak the word, and let my servant be healed. For I also am a man set under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my slave, do this. And the slave does it. Remember who the centurion was. He was a commander of the forces of the emperor. He was a man with power and authority. He was used to being served by his servants and his soldiers. He commanded the respect of local populations. And he was not a Jew. So the humility and faith of this man amazed Jesus. He wasn't accustomed to seeing this in Roman occupiers, so he remarked from this passage, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. And that was all Jesus said. No statement of healing, no promise of restoration. Yet when the messengers returned to the centurion's house, they found the servant as fit as a fiddle. Well, two things strike me about this story. First of all, faith works because Christ is Lord, not because Christ is present. Faith works because Christ is Lord, not because Christ is present. This story is the story of a long distance healing. You don't have to be present to win. And Jesus never looked the centurion in the eye. He never touched the, the sick slave. Yet this slave was healed. You see, faith works long distance. Jesus doesn't have to be physically present for miracles to happen. And this is good news, since he hasn't been present physically on earth for a couple of thousand years. Yet the transformation of faith is still not only a possibility, it's a reality. Before he ascended to heaven, Jesus told the disciples, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe, in John 20, and verse 29. And then to the first letter of Peter, 
reminds the second generation of Christians who had never seen Jesus alive in verses 8 and 9. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. You see, faith works because we believe in Jesus, not because we see Jesus. He's the Lord, and he has authority over the powers of the world like the centurion had over his servants and soldiers. All he has to do is say the word, and things happen. You see, that's authority. Many nights, Judy and I can be found sitting in our room reading or watching some TV, and on one occasion, without even looking up from her book, she made the offhand comment, I'm kind of warm. So I put down my book, got up out of bed, walked across the bedroom, and turned on the ceiling fan. Or other times she will say, I can't hear very well. So I reach for the remote control and turn up the volume. And if you are a couple who has been married for many years, you can relate to what's happening. I thought, man, she's good. She was warm. I was fine. She didn't have to get up and turn on the ceiling fan. And she didn't have to ask me to get up and turn on the ceiling fan either. I just did it because I knew she was warm. After 40 plus years, I think maybe she might have me trained. Now that's authority. But the centurion spoke a word of faith. Jesus spoke the word of authority. And transformation happened. And if you need transformation to happen in your life, simply trust in Jesus and speak the word of faith and you can be made whole. You can be transformed. But the second thing that struck me about this story is that faith happens in unexpected places. There are no boundaries on God's amazing grace, no limits to his healing power. And sometimes faith is present where you would least expect it. Luke takes particular pains in his gospel to show how Jesus reached outside of the established religious community to extend the grace of God. He came for the least, the last, and the lost. Women, children, poor people, Romans, Samaritans, tax collectors, lepers. Jesus loved them all and touched them all with his healing power. In this particular story, there's clearly something unusual going on. First, the appeal comes from the Jewish elders who just three chapters earlier in Luke had been ready to stone Jesus for his teaching, specifically that the grace of God was often made manifest outside the covenant community. But now, they themselves appeal to Jesus on behalf of the Roman centurion. The Galileans felt about the Romans like many Middle Eastern folks may feel about Americans who occupy their land. And the Romans didn't even pretend to be there for humanitarian purposes. But there was the centurion, a friend to the Jews, humble in his authority, a believing heathen, if we might put it that way. And clearly in this story, God is offering us a glimpse of the kingdom that's totally outside the box. It's outside of our usual way of thinking. Faith and the healing power of God can happen in some unexpected places. Years ago, Chuck Colson was standing in line at the airport in Jakarta, Indonesia, 
a place where tensions between Christians and Muslims run high. And he and some colleagues from Prison Fellowship, Holson's prison ministry, had been traveling all night to get to the airport. And the morning was hot and steamy, and they were exhausted. And the line was incredibly long and being handled in the most inefficient way imaginable. And Colson's group was in grave danger of missing their flight and being stuck in Jakarta. But Chuck was determined not to let his circumstances control his attitude. So we kept up a conversation with his friends, and they laughed and made the best of their situation. Two years later, Colson received a letter from a businessman who lived in Singapore. And the man had been a follower of Confucius, but he sent his children to a Presbyterian Sunday school for the moral training of Christianity. One Sunday, as he picked up his kids, he heard the end of the sermon, and the preacher was talking about Chuck Colson and holding up a copy of Chuck's first book, called Born Again. And the book tells how Colson came through Watergate and gave his life to Christ. And the cover of the book had Chuck's picture on it. A few months later, this businessman from Singapore was stuck in a long line on a steamy morning at the airport in Jakarta. Ahead of him in line, he saw the same face he had seen on the cover of the Born Again book. The businessman was so impressed with Colson's patience and cheerfulness in a frustrating situation that when he got back to Singapore, he bought the book, he read it, and committed his life to Christ. Chuck Colson wasn't even present, but faith was. And through faith, God transformed a life. Listen to this quote that I found quite a while back. I'm not even sure whose quote it is, so credit to the person who wrote it. And he wrote, or she wrote, when we see what God can do with a person who responds in faith, when we see how grace works for some of the most unlikely candidates on the planet, when we understand what awesome possibilities we have for kingdom witness on any given day, wherever we may be, then we realize that we're walking on holy ground each and every day of our lives. We're living in a place of holy mystery. The people who followed Jesus realized that. Eugene Peterson paraphrases the verse that follows this healing story in these words. They all realized they were in a place of holy mystery, that God was at work among them. They were quietly worshipful and then noisily grateful, calling out among themselves, God is back, looking to the needs of his people. Are you finally aware of that reality today? You and I are standing in a place of holy mystery. God is present in the world and in us and working to transform his people. And you and I have the opportunity to join with Christ in the redemption of this planet Earth. We can join with others some like us, many not like us, who have sensed God's holy mystery and shared the communion of God. One of the best movies of all times is the 1984 film Places in the Heart. And it stars several great actors such as Sally Field and Danny Glover and John Malkovich and Ed Harris, Amy Madigan. And the film tells a story that took place in East Texas during the Great Depression. Edna Spaulding, played by Sally Field, was left with a small cotton farm after her husband, the local sheriff, was tragically killed by a young black man who was drunk and had a gun. 
In anger, the white men of the town lynched the killer. In order to keep the farm, Edna Spaulding, who had never farmed in her life, had to race the other farmers to get the first bale of cotton to the gin in the fall. And the first bale got an extra money prize, which would be enough to make the mortgage payment on the farm. Helping Edna on the farm were two children, Frank and Possum, a blind man, Mr. Will, and a transient black farmhand named Mose. And with Mose's knowledge of farming and working from dawn to dusk and beyond, the Spaldings made the first bale, saved the farm, and incurred the wrath of the local clan members. And they beat Mose unmercifully and ran him out of town. The final scene in the movie is one of the most powerful you will ever see on film, I believe. In church, the choir stands to sing the hymn in the garden. And the communion elements are passed as the preacher recites the words, how the Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body given for you. Then the cup. Drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for the forgiveness of sins. As the elements are passed down the pew, you see the community that's gathered under the grace of God. There's the band leader at the local barn dances. There's the banker who tried to take the farm, then put on the KKK hood. There's a rival farmer who tried to beat Edna out of her mortgage payment. Then the bread and juice are passed to most. But wait, didn't he leave town? And what's a black man doing in church with white people in Texas in the 1930s? Most hands communion to Mr. Will, the blind man, who hands it to the children Possum and Frank. Then the bread and juice are passed to Edna, who takes communion and hands the elements to her husband, who was killed in the first scene of the movie. He hands the body and blood of the Lord to the young black man who shot him. And with each passing, the words are repeated. The peace the peace of God. It's the peace of God that we find in a place of holy mystery. The peace that passes all human understanding as we read in Philippians. And it becomes peace to the prejudiced whose hatred destroys them and others. Peace to the persecuted who bear the wounds of hatred. Peace to the murdered and peace to the killer, peace to the women, the children, the blind, the least, the last, and the lost. Peace to all who are willing to hear and speak the word of faith, whatever their circumstances. So who will sit at the table with you? With whom will you share the peace of God? Will there be people of other races, other cultures, other classes, other religions, other lifestyles? And are you willing to be a witness to the good news wherever, however, and with whomever you can? What do you need to be a transforming, makeover-making force in the world, in your world? And do you need faith? A simple trust in God, maybe for the first time in your life. Then as our message is entitled, just say the word. Do you need healing of wounds, physical, emotional, spiritual, some old, some new? Just say the word. Do you need renewal of the fire for Christ that once kindled so brightly in your heart? A restoration of the walk you used to walk. Just say the word. 
Do you need an openness of mind and heart to let go of long-held stereotypes and prejudices? We're talking a lot about that these days, aren't we? So that you can see the God child in every human being. Just say the word. This morning, Christ invites you and me as we come into this place of holy mystery, whether it's a church, a home, a backyard, whatever the place may be. As we come into that place of holy mystery, to speak the word of faith and receive transformation from God. And that's the challenge this morning. That's the joy of this word this morning. Whatever your need, just say the word. And Christ can and will make you whole. Let's pray. Father, there are so many within the sound of our voices, Lord, who need a touch from you who need to be built up in their faith, who need to have a, a relationship with Jesus Christ so that, that faith can build and transform in each life. Father, we thank you for the transformation of faith. We thank you that we can simply say a word of belief, say a word of trust in you, and you will walk with us, that you will provide what we need to face each circumstance, that you will give us peace, and courage to move day by day. And Father, I pray for anyone who may be listening to these words this morning who has not experienced that transformation. It's not very difficult. We just need to say the word and trust in the finished work of Jesus to transform us into new creations. And Father, I trust that's the truth of each of our lives today. And I pray this with much thanksgiving. In Jesus' name, amen.
Oh,